For reasons that utterly escape everyone involved, you're listening to a bipolar, a schizophrenic, and a podcast. Here are your hosts, Gabe Howard and Michelle Hammer. Welcome to this week's episode of A Bipolar, A Schizophrenic, and A Podcast. I'm Gabe. I have bipolar. Hi, I'm Michelle. I'm schizophrenic. And today we are going to try to give some helpful information and maybe demystify things like support groups, peer support groups, support groups read by uh, medical staff like social workers or doctors, kind of talk about our experiences, experiences we've heard from others, and just try to tie it up in a nice little bow for those of you who are sitting there thinking, should I go to a group support group and what's it going to be like and huh? Hmm. Huh. You've been to a lot of support groups, right, Gabe? I personally love support groups. I, I've been to, to all forms. I've been to the ones led by a psychologist. I've been to ones led by social workers. I've been to ones led by peer supporters. Uh, yeah, I, I am a I am a big, big, big believer. Uh, and I go to a drop-in center, uh, which is uh, run by people with mental illness and addiction for people with mental illness and addiction to drop in. So it's not exactly a support group, but it's still a group setting for people with mental illness and or addiction to kind of chill. Yeah, I do that too when I go to Fountain House in New York City. It's kind of just like a clubhouse for people with mental illness. And it's not necessarily group therapy, but you're around like-minded people and you can have really good conversations and there's really just no judgment there. And it's, it's a really nice place to be around. You sort of feel comfortable there because it's set up for people like you and me. It's more like you're not being judged. You feel no judgment in a support group. Everybody's like-minded. Nobody's thinking bad things about anything you say. You can just have a just a normal conversation. And maybe you think somebody said something weird, but then you're like, you know what? I'm at this support group too. What maybe something I say somebody else thinks is weird, but it's okay because we're all talking to each other openly. Let's take this in sections. So the section number one, we're going to talk about consumer operated services or peer run organizations, drop in centers, clubhouses like Fountain House, where you go in New York City, the peer center where I go in Columbus, Ohio. And there's 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 hundreds and hundreds of these models across the United States. So let's do that first. You go to probably one of the most famous drop in centers in the country. You're you're really super lucky to live in New York City because Fountain House has all kinds of services. Don't you have like a rooftop garden? There might be a rooftop garden. I don't know if I've been there, but I am in the horticulture unit where they do all the planting and all that kind of stuff. And sometimes I do help with the planting, but a lot of times I just go there with my computer and I do my work there because I like to be surrounded by people that I can talk to as I'm doing my work. And it's just friendly, it's nice, it's calming. I mean, I could go to a Starbucks, but that's boring. Why not go to Fountain House, chit-chat with a bunch of fun people while I do my work? You know, the, the Peer Center where I go doesn't have a garden. I mean, yeah. no, we, we don't we don't have a garden. And and to call it a horticultural unit. <laughs> yeah. That that that's seriously really, really badass. But let's talk about that for a moment because you know, some people hearing this, they're like, wait a minute, what does a garden have to do with mental health? And I'll tell you. This is probably my favorite thing to explain to people because at the Peer Center, people come in and they're like, Oh, you you have mental illness and you have addiction issues and you're playing cards. How does playing cards help? How does gardening help? And, and here's what I say. Are you ready for this? I'm ready. When you sit down with a group of like-minded people to play cards, you talk and this whole game of spades or uno or whatever game you choose to play, that's just kind of the distraction. What you're actually doing is talking about the things that are bothering you, just like everybody else who plays cards. You talk about your week. You talk about your grandkids. You talk about your grandparents if you're young. You just If you're playing cards against humanity, you feel bad, <laughs> but in the best of ways. But these are very social activities. So while you're doing these social things, you're talking about the things that are, that are eating you inside, or you're bragging about the things that you're proud of to other like-minded people. Now, nobody leaves Fountain House or the peer center or any drop-in center and says, hey, I said that I was 35 days sober and I was really proud of myself and everybody said they were proud of me too. No, they say, I played cards. 
but we know that you can play cards anywhere. You went for that reassurance from, from people who are like you and understand. And that's really the magic of these places. It is the magic of these places. People find it interesting that I have friends that are so much older than me. I go to Fountain House. One of my best friends there, she's 56. Like people, you're friends with a 56-year-old woman. I'm like, no, she's a really awesome person. She has great things to say. I love speaking to her. Why, why is it judgment? Is it stigma that she's 56? What's the big deal that she's 56? We have like-minded mental capacity with, with mental illness, and we just talk about regular things. Age doesn't even make a difference there. It is hard to find people, probably because of the stigma, th that understand what we're going through. You know, I, I live with bipolar disorder, and as you know, people with bipolar disorder, except for, like, my people, we ain't wearing shirts that say bipolar. Uh, so people with schizophrenia, people with depression, we, we tend not to advertise it. So it's really, really easy to feel alone. But when you go to a drop-in center, you go to a place like this, you, you can sit around other people who also admit to living with mental illness and you can have real conversations about it. Listen, M Michelle and I, we didn't meet in a drop-in center, but we could have. You and I could have met in a drop-in center. Oh, definitely. Yeah, we could have just been sitting there like, hey, I take meds and it causes sexual side effects and my mouth is dry. And you would have been like, oh my God, me too. And we could have just had this great conversation about how sometimes our medication pisses us off. And when we left, we would have felt better because I would have been like, oh my God, I thought I was the only one. And you would have been like, wow, at least I'm not pitiful like that guy. And the whole thing just drives forward. That's the magic of having a place where we belong. And everybody has this. If you want to play basketball, you go to a gym. Mm -hmm. If you're fat, you join a gym. Um, or, or you eat a bunch of Oreos. I love Oreos. All I'm saying is... It's, it's a place of acceptance. It is a place of acceptance. And everybody has this in society. Everybody has this. There are all kinds of clubs, social events. There's a whole website called Meetup where like-minded people can... Meet up. That's how I found my post-collegiate lacrosse team was meetup.com. There you go. So we like to be around people who understand us. We like to feel understood. And that that's not a mental illness thing. That's not an addiction thing. That's a human thing. And that's why drop-in centers, consumer-operated services, peer-run organizations, the clubhouse model, that's why all of these things are fantastic. But that sort of leads us into support groups because support groups are, they're not the clubhouse model because, you, you know, clubhouse drop-in centers, et cetera, they're open like for periods of time, you know, they're open for like, you know, morning to night, et cetera. Whereas a support group, especially a community support group is usually like an hour to an hour and a half, maybe once or twice a week. So very different vibe. I would agree with that. Yes. And there's two types of those groups. Well, there's there's probably more than two types, but two types that we're going to talk about here. There's peer-run support group, which means a person with mental illness running a support group for other people with mental illness, or in the case of like Alcoholics Anonymous, recovered alcoholics running a support group for people who are trying to recover or are in recovery from alcoholism. Yes. So that's the peer run model. And then there's the more, you know, medical model. It's run by a social worker or a psychologist or, you know, somebody with some sort of training and they both have their pluses and minuses. One is not better than the other. They both have their pluses and minuses. Now, Michelle, you went to more than a few, if I'm not mistaken. A support group? Yeah. A support group that was led by a doctor or, or a social worker. Well, uh, the, the first kind of a support group I really went to was when I was in a psych ward and it was just kind of run by a nurse and we would just go around talking and something that I got out of it that I didn't even really follow was, do you journal? You should keep a journal <laughs> and measure your mood in that way. And I was like, oh, okay, sure. But the most reason why I even went to those little support groups that were having in the psych ward was because I was so bored, I just wanted to talk to people. But that actually was really helpful, and it was nice talking to people. And of course, that wasn't my last time in the psych ward, because the next one I went to, we didn't do any of that. And I realized, this is the worst hospital ever, because that other hospital was so much more helpful, because they had, a, like a support group for us to all talk. But this other hospital didn't do anything for us. 
So I realized that a support group in a hospital is actually very beneficial. It made me feel better. We were talking to everybody else that was in, in the psych ward then, and they were talking about things that got them there, things in the past, learning about them. And it was very interesting to get everyone's story. And then when I was in the other hospital, nobody really shared stories. And there was no support group. Everyone was just kind of talking to each other a little bit, but nothing was really organized. And it made me feel more lonely because I didn't know why anyone else was in there. I think that it's interesting that you were in this other hospital and you were like, oh my God, I'm so bored. I'm going to go to this thing. And please correct me if I'm wrong, but you thought you were going to hate it. You thought it was stupid and dumb and you didn't want to go. You were just so bored. You were like, oh, I'm going to do this even though it's crap. Yeah. And then you missed it. Like you got so much out of it, you wanted to do it again. Yes. I can see why you believed this. I, I, I don't I don't judge you at all. When 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 somebody said, Hey, I want you to sit in a room full of strangers and talk about your eating disorder or your bipolar disorder or your depression or suicidality, I was like, No. Why why do I want to No. No, this is dumb. This is stupid. I felt the exact same way. I got so much out of it. I first started like you with the, you know, the, the more, I don't want to say traditional, but, but the, the kind that everybody thinks about with the, the, the nurse or the doctor or the social worker sitting up front and the, the fun is organized in, in a specific way medically, you know, they ask questions, everybody shares that kind of thing. But then as that evolved, when I got back out in the community, you know, those were expensive and I didn't have a lot of money. But what was free or very, very low cost, like, you know, throw a couple dollars in a hat kind of thing, were peer-run support groups. And that was the same kind of idea. Yeah. People sharing stories, et cetera, mm -hmm. except the facilitator or moderator is another person living with mental illness. Again, the, the most famous peer-run support group of all time is Alcoholics Anonymous. It's exactly like that, except for mental illness or depression or bipolar or, you know, just depending on how it's structured. I loved these groups. The one that I joined very first. Are you ready? Yes. Bipolar bears. Bipolar bears. That sounds good because you are as big as a bear. Oh, man. That's so mean. <laughs> I want to see a fight between you and a bear and see who wins. The bipolar bear. I, I picked this support group, though, because I was scared. And the name was so adorable. <laughs> I know that's kind of a messed up thing to say, but I just I thought, how can I be scared going to a group of bipolar bears? Honestly, that, that, that's just what I thought. Like, how can I be scared? Was there a stuffed animal bear that you had to hold every time you were speaking? No, but that would be a really good idea. I, I was very nervous to go. And here are some hints and tips for some people who are nervous to go. Go with a friend. Mm -hmm. Even if that friend doesn't go into the room with you, even if the friend just drops you off and waits in the hall, one, that's a really good friend. And two... You know, sometimes that's all it takes, you know, somebody to like pick you up, go to dinner first, then go. I had somebody help me go to the group because I was scared. She didn't go in with me, but she dropped me off and waited. And I thought that was really, really super cool of her because I was scared to go. But then, you know, I, I got to know people. I made friends with the moderator, facilitator, you know, I just, I became more comfortable just as, as, as we're all, you know, as, as, as humans do. And then I just became a person who went to this support group for a long time. And then after a while, I felt that I wasn't getting anything out of it anymore. Like I, I had shared all of my stories. I had heard a lot of stories. And there's a lot of power in that, too. There's a lot of power in hearing other people's stories. There really is. There really is. Because you might think that you've done horrible things in your life and then you hear somebody else and you're like, oh, we're equal. Or you might hear somebody else, oh, that's way worse than what I did. And it's not about judgment. It's it's it, about sort of sharing the, yeah, the it, burden. It's about understanding what your illness is and what could happen, what could not happen, and what you've done in your life and how you can accept it, really. Yeah, and when, when somebody tells you something that they did, when they unload on you, you know, they just, I didn't mow the lawn and I was supposed to mow the lawn. And then you say to them, you're like, look, I, I didn't mow the lawn either. There's that connection. There's that understanding. And that person feels better. And then you're like, wait, now I feel better because I helped you. And there's just, there's a lot of power in that more so than people think. And listen, replace lawn with anything you want, obviously. When I walked into these groups for the first time, I thought I was the only person that never mowed the lawn. And then I learned that it was just so common. And then after I was there for a while, new people walked in and they thought they were the only people that never mowed the lawn. And I got to tell them that I don't mow the lawn. 
And I'm also thinking, wow, of all the analogies and examples to use, why did I pick lawn mowing? I don't really know because I've never mowed a lawn either. Oh, it's okay though. Neither have I. The, the only peer support group I ever went to, I went with my bipolar friend who took me to the bipolar support group at Columbia University where it's just donation to get in. Yeah. And so I went there and I was talking. I couldn't relate fully to what everybody was saying, but it was very interesting because this one guy was saying that his hypersexuality was so big and he's gay and he had, you know, unprotected sex and he got HIV. So, you know, I'm schizophrenic in a bipolar group and people are talking about, you know, hypersexuality and look, look what happened to this guy. I'm a schizophrenic. I go through all these troubles. I do all these things. But wow, look what can happen. You know, you learn people's stories and, it, you know, you kind of just understand that things could be so much worse, even though you don't think that your life is amazing. We should probably touch for a moment because I, I don't want people to get the idea that it's like the suffering Olympics, which we've talked about on this show before. It, yeah. It's not a matter of somebody's story being, you know, better, worse, but at the same time, it is. I, I know exactly what you're saying because sometimes I think, oh man, I, I, I thought that I hit rock bottom, but I could have gone further. And then other people, they hear my story and they're like, oh wow, this guy is way worse than me. It, it, it's not about the judgment. It's about the understanding, the gravity of the situation and the breadth of the situation and just how just how bad it can get. Yeah. And, uh, and then it's also about finding those people and lifting them up and carrying them up and helping them and uh, making it so that their rock bottom is way far below them because my rock bottom was way, way down there today. But you know, when I started going to these support groups, I was standing on rock bottom. Hold up. We need support from our sponsors. We'll be right back. This episode is sponsored by BetterHelp.com. Secure, convenient, and affordable online counseling. All counselors are licensed, accredited professionals. Anything you share is confidential. Schedule secure video or phone sessions, plus chat and text with your therapist whenever you feel it's needed. A month of online therapy often costs less than a single traditional face-to-face -face session. Go to BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central and experience seven days of free therapy to see if online counseling is right for you. BetterHelp.com forward slash Psych Central. We're back talking about different types of support groups. The support groups that you went to were so helpful for you that you became a facilitator. What was that like for you? So one day I realized that, that I wasn't getting anything out of the support groups anymore. So I stopped going. And, and that's, that's a great decision to make. Some people believe that you have to go to support groups for the rest of your life or you're turning your back on people. That, that's not true. You, you just keep going until you no longer get use out of it. And then you step aside and let the next people sort of rise into their places but I missed it. And an organization that I was volunteering for put out a call for peer support facilitators for these groups. You had to go through training. I, I had to go through a three-day training, eight hours a day for three days. I had to learn a whole bunch of stuff. I had to pass a test. I had, they had to make sure that I was good at it, I guess. We, we learned things about like hot potatoes, like what to do if somebody messes certain words, how to get people help, how to have resources, how to structure the group, how to, you know, the rules of engagement as it were, how to de-escalate and on and on and on. And and I got through that. And then here, here's me and, and another person. We get our own support group. Yay. You know, it's, Yay. Like, it's, like, it's like Gabe and, and Jane. We'll call her Jane because I want to protect her, uh, her anonymity. Gabe and Jane now have the support group and people started coming. And uh, it's different when you're the facilitator. The biggest thing that you have to remember when you're the facilitator is it's not about you. It's not about me at all. Like there's no part of it that it's about me. The only thing that I'm there to do is make sure that people are obeying the rules and keeping people safe and making sure that people have the resources that they need. That's it. In a, in a perfect world, I wouldn't speak at all. Really? Yeah. I would come in. I would start the meeting. I would have everybody read the principles of support. I would have everybody read the group guidelines. I would ask everybody by show of hands if they understood. I would ask who would like to go first. And then if everybody takes their turn one at a time 
and nobody gets upset or triggered and everybody shares information and has a nice, reasonable conversation, the next thing that I would need to say is, all right, well, we have about five minutes left, so we want to go ahead and wind down. Are there there anything that I can answer? Because we always like to end on time. That was very important. We didn't want groups to go on and on and on and on and on. That would be perfect. And, you know, it, believe it or not, it worked that way a lot. Usually the most I had to do, it would say something like, all right, who wants to go next? Or hang on, hang on. Hey, hang on, um, Jim. Uh, Michelle has been waiting to talk, Michelle. You know, stuff like that. Just like little things. That's funny because it is such an opposite experience that I had in the in, in the group that I went to. Maybe because I'm in New York City and people just can't stop talking all the time. <laughs> But it was just one after another, after another, after another. A lot of people are talking about, you know, burning bridges, self-sabotage, all kinds of things like that with their partners that are cheating on their partners all the time with the hypersexuality, things like that. And at one point, I, I think I had mentioned something about me being in this group, but I'm schizophrenic and a girl goes, oh, you don't even know what people say to me. They said, they say, oh, thank God you're bipolar and not schizophrenic. And I'm like, Yeah. Feeling the stigma in this group. Well, but but wait though, you you even in your own description though, you said that everybody talked one at a time. Yeah, but it was just flowing, 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 oh, yeah. flowing, flowing. It was never who wants to talk next. Everybody was chatting. <laughs> everybody just went on and this and this and this. It was just over. But it sounds like you had a really good facilitator because nobody talked over each other. There were no side conversations, and if there were, did the facilitator shut it down? So uh, hang on, hang on. It wasn't, the facilitator at the end was like, this really went very well. I didn't didn't really have to moderate at all. You guys talked really great. And and that's what I mean. And that's what I mean by if you, if you do a good job, you're just kind of like the cop sitting on the side of the road. You don't have to do anything. People see you and they slow down. If you're a good facilitator, you just kind of establish the rules and you enforce them. But you, you know, you, you don't have to enforce them unless people are, are breaking them. And for the most part, groups went fine. They went fine. People learned from each other. They shared. People talked. And, you know, support groups are like a buffet. Take what you want and leave the rest. Just because something is put out there in a support group doesn't mean that you have to take it, accept it, or agree with it. You are more than welcome to leave it right there. And I would encourage people to do this week after week after week. And it went fine. Were there ever any problems? From time to time, there would be a problem. I really, really want to stress that that 90% of the time, it was fantastic. Nothing more than, you know, just reminding people not to cross talk, you know, because sometimes there'd be like a little cross talking where somebody's having a private conversation. I'd remind them that, you know, they need to leave the room if they want to do that, that kind of thing. Or, you know, I would notice that maybe a shyer person just wasn't getting, wasn't jumping in. So I'd quiet everybody down so that, you, you know, Michelle would have a chance to talk because she was maybe being a little shy, uh, you, you know, stuff like that. But, but every now and again, a, a, a fight would break out. And, and by really? fight, no, not, and, and that, that's really poor wording on a podcast, an argument, a disagreement, tensions would rise, people would ramp up, backs would be raised. And I had de-escalation techniques that I used. I'd say, all right, stop. Everybody calm down. Please, let's all take a deep breath. Michelle, I understand that you're upset that somebody said that lacrosse isn't a real sport. Okay, and and Gabe... No one would say that. I understand that you think that lacrosse is not a real sport, but that that is not kind. You, 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 you should really apologize to Michelle for saying that. And then the person usually would apologize. And I would say, and Michelle, when somebody says something you disagree with, yelling at them is, is not the the best way. So would you mind apologizing for yelling? And then you would say, I I'm sorry, I yelled at you. And I'd say, okay, now let's talk about what we were talking about before. And I'd remember like what started the fight and I'd get us back on that. And almost, I would say all but Honestly, I think this worked 100% of the time. I just really don't like to say 100% of the time. The two people that got in the argument would become like BFFs. They almost always would because they would talk it out. You know, I I would say, look, I I didn't mean it wasn't a real sport. I was just nervous and I don't understand lacrosse. And you would, you would say, yeah, look, I, you know, I didn't invent lacrosse. I don't know why I got so mad. And I'd be like, but you're a sports fan. And you'd be like, yeah, I really like hockey. (gasps) I like hockey. And then the next thing you know, we're having a podcast. How many people were in your, in these groups with you? 
anywhere from the smallest groups I ever had were probably uh, six or seven. The largest groups that I ever had were 15 to 16. Oh, that's huge. Yeah, we weren't allowed to have more than 15 people. That's so, gigantic. Yeah, every now and again, we would let the 16th person sneak in before we started turning people away. But but 15 was our maximum limit, which is why I'm saying 15 or 16, because we, we really weren't supposed to go over 15. Because you're right, that's a huge group. And there were two of us. There were two facilitators, and we would sit in a circle, and we'd sit on either one, and we'd make little notes at each other, and we'd look at each other, and we would just keep people on the right yeah. path. I, I knew one person in the group that I went to. She was just there to listen. She just wanted to right. sit there and listen to people. She didn't want to participate. Her her method was just listening. And I know that um it was interesting. There was a guy next to me. He said he was actually a, a preacher, and he doesn't really like to talk that much. He likes to listen. But he was saying he's a preacher, and nobody that he works with knows that he's bipolar because he's a preacher, and he has to keep that that kind of like, you know, that he's a strong, you know, successful man and he can't tell anyone, you know, in the church that he has bipolar because that would make him look bad. But he comes to these meetings and he listens. He doesn't speak that much, but it just helps him by being there. By being in the room. Yeah. By being in the, in the presence of other people. That's enough for some people. Now, I me, mean, I'm a talker. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> I, I, I like to do a lot of talking, a lot of sharing. I, I like to offer support, but I, I also needed to remember when to listen and when to shut up. And sometimes when I was a group member, the facilitators would have to put their hand up and remind me to stop talking. And that's a of course. good thing for a facilitator to do. And if the facilitator doesn't write, you're not embarrassed. You're not ashamed. You're understanding that they're making space for everybody. I, I really like support groups and I encourage people to go to them. If they are available in your community, please go. Oftentimes they're free. Maybe you got to throw a couple bucks in a hat. But even if you just sit there and listen, you'll learn so much and you'll be in the presence of other people that have similar experiences. It's it's very it's very helpful to know that you're not alone. Exactly. And some of those people, listen, some of those people will annoy you. There's personality types that you will not get along oh, with. Oh, trust me, yes. And that's okay too. Because it shows you that even people who are annoying have mental illness. <laughs> That's okay. My mother annoys me. I still love her. Your mother annoys you, Michelle. Just a little. Just a little. Just and a little. I still love her. Yes. So the people in the support group, you will find that common ground. And you don't have to be best friends. In fact, I discourage going to a support group to make friends. You should go to a support group to get support. It doesn't mean that a friendship won't come out of it, but that should not be your goal. Your goal should be to attentively listen, and your goal should be to truthfully share. And if you do that, I think that you'll get a lot out of it. So if you are afraid to go, find a buddy and go, even if the buddy just sits outside, or just go on your own. Talk to the facilitator. Let them know you're scared. Show up early so that you're there before the big group gets there and tell the facilitator that you're nervous. You can always change your name too. Hey, there, there is most, all the groups that I did, everybody went by their first name and you're right. We didn't, I didn't, I didn't card anybody. Yeah. <laughs> so maybe everybody's name was wrong. I don't know. I mean, you, you can change your name. You can you not say what your job is. You yes. can just share only what you want to share. If there's exactly. one issue you want to talk about, you can only talk, you might just, only talk about that issue if that's what you want to speak about. You're not forced to say anything you don't want to say. Exactly. You can share as much as you want or as little as you want. All that's required is honesty. It's not full disclosure. And I think that people miss that sometimes. They think that it's some sort of an interrogation. It's not. It's it's participation at your speed, at your rate. And if the support group isn't working out for you, don't go back. There's nothing wrong with that. If I am very lucky, as are you, Michelle, because we live in big cities. There's there's dozens of support groups. So when I didn't like one, I just joined another one. If that's the case for you, you know, support group shop. If you only have the one, you might have to work a little harder to make it work. But yeah. I, I really encourage support groups. And finally, the last thing that we want to say is psychcentral.com has a ton of online support groups. I like the in-person ones certainly better. The advantage of the online ones is they're open 24 hours a day. They're available when you need them. It's kind of like a drop-in center for online. So visit psychcentral.com, join the support groups, 
and just have a blast. Those groups are really, really awesome. And they don't pelt you with advertising or ask you for a bunch of stuff either. So we we really love Psych Central here at a Bipolar Schizophrenic and a Podcast. Michelle, are we out? I think we're out. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Remember, you can head over to store.psychcentral.com and pick up a Define Normal shirt. When they're gone, they're gone, unless, of course, we order more. Or you can run over to psychcentral.com, join a support group, read great articles. Everything over there is free, and they are a very generous supporter of this podcast. We will see everybody next week. Talk it out. You've been listening to a bipolar, a schizophrenic, and a podcast. If you love this episode, don't keep it to yourself. Head over to iTunes or your preferred podcast app to subscribe, rate, and review. To work with Gabe, go to GabeHoward.com. To work with Michelle, go to Schizophrenic.nyc. For free mental health resources and online support groups, head over to PsychCentral.com. The show's official website is PsychCentral.com slash BSP. You can email us at show at PsychCentral.com. Thank you for listening and share widely.